All statements and opinions expressed by guests of the Adult in the Room podcast are strictly their own and do not necessarily reflect the beliefs or opinions of the host, producers, or advertisers. All interviews are presented in their most complete possible form in the interests of free speech. No statements should be interpreted as financial, legal, or medical advice. Listener and viewer discretion are strongly advised. It's the Adult in the Room podcast with Victoria Taft. That's me. Welcome to the Adult in the Room podcast with Victoria Taft. And you know, the last time Chadwick Moore and I got together to discuss his new book entitled Tucker. Here it is right here. Uh, It wasn't out yet. And Tucker had been fired. He's sent to the beach by Fox News. And this is why Chadwick had to go back to the lab and include the information about this newly unleashed Tucker as one person put it. Now, we can, we're going to get to that. But I'll bet we'll find out that Chadwick didn't really have much to do to rewrite any of his book. Just a few things. This biography of Tucker Carlson is really remarkable. It really is because it gives such great insights into a person that we've seen on television for so long and has been number one in cable news for so long and all of a sudden we can't see him anymore. So it's more important than ever to find out some of the tidbits about this man that we really came to appreciate um, and respect on television. And let's remember, however, what an earthquake it was to dump Tucker Carlson. I mean... Uh, the person who hosted the most watched show in cable news, and that's saying something, in cable news, in cable. Huge, just a huge thing. And he was just like, oh, we never knew why. The man who hosted the appointment viewing that was Tucker Carlson tonight was just, you know, one night he was eating pizza with Chadwick Moore, and the next night he's off. And, um, you know, he gave conservatives of a certain bent a voice, not the, you know, the usual uh, conservative voice, something a little different, spicier, and uh, much more honest, I believe. So what gives? Why would they do that? Why would Fox News just unload the guy? And since then, it's been a parlor game. Why would Fox News get rid of the number one news host in the business? Why would that even be a thing? It is uh, suicide. Okay. Why were there stories that Fox News wanted Tucker Carlson off the air until after the 2024 election. What was that all about? And would anyone want to hear about Tucker Carlson anymore since he was removed from the most watched network show or cable network on on cable? I mean, why would they do that? But would they want to watch him anymore? Well, I would I I'll bet that Chadwick Moore knows the answer to that question. And it's Oh, yeah, we want to know more about him. We want to know what he's going to do next. So indeed, in this thoroughly enjoyable, it's an inspiring biography of Chadwick Moore shares things about Carlson you'd never guess at. His good friends, the people who give him career advice, that one was a shocker to me, whose funerals he'd move heaven and earth to get to, his iconoclastic way and his uh, belief of what his place is in the world, his deep faith. Good job, Chadwick Moore. Welcome back to the Adult in the Room podcast. Oh, thank you, Victoria. Great to be with you again. It's really it's really terrific to have you. Now that I've been able to read the book, got it when I was on vacation. Well, you know, I got it uh, at home, so I've been busily going through it. Well, I guess, you know, how hard was it? The obvious question is, how hard was it to write a biography of a guy who's a moving target? <laughs> That's a, that is a great question and very well put. Um, yeah, well, it's, it, you know, he really, I mean, he entrusted me to tell his story. He never asked to read a word of it. He just, you know, sort of, here you go. Here's my life. Come hang out. Sure. You want to, you know, visit this time. I, you know, I was staying in his house most of the time when I was with him. Uh, and, uh, I guess with, I don't know, I guess when you really want to get to like the core of who someone is and you just really want to figure that part of them and, and paint, you know, a three dimensional portrait of a human being. I guess none of this stuff that's sort of happening around him all that matters that much. I mean, I think the book is, I think it's different than a lot of biographies because it's not only a story of Tucker Carlson, but also a story of a political movement and this time. And it's, I think a lot of it puts you right in the action of stuff happening right now as it's unfolding. But at the same time, it's, there's a bigger story that, and then there's this man at the center of all of it, who is a really interesting, really, really deep, really sensitive guy that is is portrayed as this sort of two-dimensional villain 
And uh, and I, I wanted to get to the bottom of who that guy was and, and sort of tell that story. I guess the telltale is, was he the same person that you started to investigate to get your biography written as when he was fired from Fox News? Was, was, are we talking about the same guy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's we we uh, as you mentioned, we I interviewed him a couple times after uh, he was fired from Fox and updated a book, added new chapters. I made sure everything was up to date. And he's, you know, today, and we've spoken, you know, since then too, not about the book. And, and you know, I'd say today he's probably has a lot more perspective. I think he's, uh, I think his, you know, time in the woods, literally time in the woods in Maine is uh, is probably um, giving him, uh, you know, a step back from all the fray to reflect a little bit. Uh, I think he's really happy right now. He seems very happy. Um, and uh, I think that he is just mainly frustrated that he's unable to work because he's, I mean, to the extent that he wants to, because he's still under contract with Fox. And we, we say he's fired, but that's, you know, not technically, it's just an easy way to say it, but he's not technically fired. He's actually still an employee of Fox News, still getting a paycheck every week to not have a show. And that will continue until uh, after the next presidential election. That's when his contracts run out, unless he can get out of this contract, which Fox doesn't want to let him out of. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, gee, why didn't they just roll over like they did for the Dominion lawsuit and let him have his way? Obviously, they don't want him anymore. Right. That's yeah, just I mean, a commentary on that damn lawsuit. That was a travesty, that it, settlement. It, it really was. And for people saying, well, they had to get rid of him because they had to save money after Dominion. Well, no, they're still paying him. <laughs> and he's not, yeah, he they're still paying him. Yeah. In BT dubs, uh, insurance companies exist for those kinds of reasons, right? right. You have key men go down. You know, so that happens. Uh, so, but, um, you know, one of the things that we've heard, let's go to the parlor game that is, hey, why did they do this? Okay, Dominion lawsuit. There's his, uh, you know, the position on the Ukraine war that you talk about a little bit in the book, his outing of outright lies told about January 6th and, and uh, the in so called investigation into it. It was, it was just a, I mean, okay, you're, you're a man of the left. Chadwick Moore, not, not, maybe not so much anymore because you're now you're conservative and because they and now they don't want you in their club. But I mean, you are a guy who grew up your professional life in New York. You're a gay individual and all that comes with that. And um, you wrote for publications that um, target themselves to the gay community and and obviously everything else that New York Times, New York Post, everything else. You're sitting there and you're looking at what happened to Tucker Carlson and you see what he's presenting about January 6th and you say to yourself, what do you say to yourself? What do you, how do you conclude what happened here? Well, I'm still, so I, I do come from the left. You're correct. I, I've been, I used to, I mean, before 2015, 2016, yeah, yeah. I voted Democrat and all that stuff. And then, um, I, and I come from liberal media before, you know, before 2016, I was working in liberal media and I, you know, I've been surrounded by these people. I mean, I guess I guess the big the the big picture answer to that question is, you know, I'm still to this day. I mean, I've seen what what certain forces have done to try to hurt this book sale that I've been in the not not because of me. I, it's not me. It's because of Tucker Carlson, what people have done to try to defame me and defame the book because they want to diminish him so much. I'm still shocked. I, people on the left, like your average rank and file lefty does not understand the world that we live in, the system we live in and how atrocious and powerful these forces are, how corrupt our country is, the the how big business and government are so hand in hand. They don't understand this stuff. They don't see it. Why would they? Their media would never report on it. They don't talk about it at their cocktail parties. They don't see this stuff. So I, I don't think I'll and I, I don't think I'll ever stop being shocked by that. And I'm and 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 I hope that I'm never shocked by that because I think you're in a or never not shocked by that. I think that that's when you're in a bad place is when you're jaded to it because it is horrifying and disgusting. So what I believe is 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 on inarguable at this point is that Tucker was taken off the air purely for ideological reasons. That's it. Obviously, it was the timing with Dominion was six days after the settlement. Uh, you know, what my sources told me is, is you know, Dominion and Fox have both denied what my sources told me. But uh, if, if, it, if it were uh, a condition in the Dominion settlement, that's one theory, which I was told, which, of course, Dominion and Fox denied. Uh, another thing could have been it was simply Fox was using this as uh, a good time to get rid of Tucker. It was a good time to get all the plebs in line at Fox News to say, look, we're going to get rid of our biggest guy. Everyone else better ship up, sh uh, shape up or ship out. It certainly put the fear of God into everyone at Fox News. It's miserable over there right now. Everyone is so unhappy and living under this great fear. 
And, you know, because he's beloved at the network. And also, you know, this would be a good opportunity to just, you know, warn everyone because Fox didn't, uh, I'm sorry, Tucker didn't push any of these theories about the voting machines being rigged on his show. Uh, right, he, he, he not, thought he they were bunk. Know. Yeah, he pushed back against them. Uh, people, there are people on, <laughs> who are still on Fox that really pushed those theories. They still have jobs, they're still on the air. Um, so it was completely ideological. Another way we know that is that, I mean, first of all, he was the only voice at that network that was that was counter narrative, you know. And all of these these GOP swamp critters would refuse to go on his show. And then, of course, appear the next hour on Sean Hannity for a nice, friendly interview because Tucker didn't want to give the, that to them. Um, there were any number of issues, I think, where he really upset uh, or was annoying some very powerful forces. January 6th being a big one that you talked about. I mean, he had members of Congress calling for him to be arrested and taken off the air because of his reporting on that. And all he was doing was asking questions and digging and, and, and trying to figure out what really happened that day. Another, of course, would be Ukraine. There's tons of money in Ukraine. BlackRock, which is a, owns a controlling majority in Fox, is because it basically manufactures all the web, weapons in this country. It's BlackRock and like one or two other companies. Uh, Staple Street Capital being the other one, which owns Dominion. So there's all these weird big companies involved in the war machine that are also really closely related to Fox News. I don't know. Um, but, you know, it could have been any number. Of, I think those are the two biggest issues. He was also the biggest critic of Big Pharma and the COVID vaccine and what was happening with that. And, of course, that's a lot of money for, for any media corporation and their advertisers. Um, and uh, but so that seems clear. And one way that to me, at least, that that's confirmed is how Fox News treated his production team. They were all fired in one fell swoop on July, um, I believe it was uh, 15th. Uh, may have been right around there. So the 17th is when they pre premiered the new lineup. Um, they basically all got a message that said, you know, this is your final day. And uh, after that, sh that shows eight, that night's 8 p.m. show, they had someone from HR waiting outside the control room to frog march them out of the building and take their um, their ID cards. That's not normal for a cable news network, especially Fox, because you're hired to work for the network. If your show gets taken off the air, you're moved to another show. And Tucker had the highest producing, the highest performing team of producers in cable news history. So Fox got rid of all of them, knowing that they were all Tucker loyalists, I imagine. They all loved him. They all loved their boss. I saw that when I wrote this book. They got along really well. They're all on the same page, um, you know, politically. So uh, that when, you know, if there are any, for me, if there are any question about the reason being ideological for which he was taken off, when that happened to his, the remaining team at, his remaining team at Fox, then that sealed the deal for me at least. Or it could be this. Let's take a look at this this uh, soundbite here. It's not just a soundbite. It's a piece of video from the Heritage Foundation speech that he gave on the Friday after the pizza show. And um, he was fired by Monday when he, before he came in. When people or crowds of people or the largest crowd of people at all, which is the federal government, the largest human organization in human history, decide that the goal is to destroy things, destruction for its own sake. Hey, let's tear it down. What you're watching is not a political movement, it's evil. So if you want to assess, and I'll put it in non, and I'll stop with this, I'll put it in non, I'll put it in non-political, uh, or non, rather non-specific theological terms, and just say, if you want to know what's evil and what's good, what are the characteristics of those? And by the way, you know, I, I think the Athenians would have agreed with this. This is not necessarily just a Christian notion. This is kind of a, I would say, widely agreed upon understanding of good and evil. What are its products? What do these two conditions produce? Well, I mean, good is characterized by order, calmness, tranquility, peace, whatever you want to call it, lack of conflict, cleanliness, Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's true. It is. And evil is characterized by their opposites. Violence, hate, disorder, division, disorganization, and filth. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. That's just true. I'm not calling for religious war. Far from it. I'm merely calling for an acknowledgement of what we're watching, which is not what, and I'm not certainly not backing the Republican Party. I mean, ugh. I'm not making a partisan point at all. I'm, I'm just noting what's super obvious. 
So he was iconoclastic. He continues to be iconoclastic. Um, but he also was a deeply, I guess, you you mention an issue that, or something that befalls him, something happens to him, and all of a sudden he, you know, straightens up and flies right. And so he's become a much more faithful individual. And there are some who believe that it was his faith that really did him in at Fox News. Talk a little bit about that if you can. Sure. Yeah. I, and that, that's one of the, you know, when people talk about sort of how he's maybe changed over the years from CNN or even before that, when he was a, a print guy, uh, I guess that was sort of the biggest change. There, there, there are a couple of ways we document in the book, book, but I think the biggest change is, is this most recent where he does really see the political battle in this country to be, as he said, one between good and evil. And I found him to be someone who's far less concerned with politics per se and more concerned with these questions of spirituality, morality, family, beauty, uh, cleanliness, maybe as I mentioned there, uh, which he sees as, 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 as which he sees as intrinsic to politics, but he doesn't care about Democrat, Republican punching games. He cares about these big questions. And, um, you know, there are certainly, so Rupert Murdoch, you know, that, that language, everyone says at Fox makes the Murdochs and the people in charge very nervous. They don't like they're not uh, they don't like theology. They don't like this good and evil talk. Um, I, I don't know if they're I don't know if they're Christian or not. I don't think they are, but I'm not sure. Uh, and they don't they there are certainly a lot of people said that that Tucker's move in this direction made them very nervous. They didn't like it. One interesting thing was this was just uh, this past winter. So a couple months before his show was taken off the air, Rupert Murdoch was engaged to this woman uh, and the two of them had dinner with Tucker Carlson. Rupert's like ninety five or something engaged to uh, yeah he's very old and and, and uh engaged to a much younger woman and um after the dinner she referred to tucker as a messenger from god and a week later rupert murdoch broke off the engagement with her and there were people at box that said that that you know freaked him out so um i think that that you know could be certainly something that when i say that you know it was ideological why he was gotten why he was let go why the show was taken off the air um you know i think it can compound with all of that because he he does um you know it's this this evolution, this spiritual evolution that I think he's had in recent years, for sure. It really is one of those things where you start looking around, you start seeing based on results, the stuff that's happening right now is um, unalloyed evil. So what's wrong with calling it out? I mean, has he changed your opinions about anything? I think he, in the course of working on this book, I think he, I mean, it, it certainly changed my life. And I mean, he, I think I think that the, the sort of rhetoric used in that in that heritage speech that you played a clip from, you know, he had he certainly has me stepping back and looking at things differently, and especially you know this role of good and evil. And I think that you know a lot of us we don't pay enough attention to that. We're too busy with point scoring and following the headlines. But um, to see it that way, especially when you speak of order and chaos, and look at at the left and how chaos everything they breed is chaos, and everything they want is chaos, whether it's it's with gender. Everything they're doing with gender is absolutely chaotic. To, you know, in the streets, to crime, to uh, it, it's it's uh, there is an evil to that, you know. And I think he's absolutely right. And I think he's he, he, certainly, uh, you know, I guess another, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's it. that's it. That's a good way. Yeah, well, you know, when I was a young Christian, people would I would often hear, "God is not the author of confusion," and that's pretty much as simple as it gets. When you start seeing chaos and confusion and you're unclear, in fact, it has informed my beliefs on things that have occurred politically recently, wherein I wonder if it's confusing to me, not because I'm just such a dimwit, but if it just makes no sense, if it makes no Ukraine war. I mean, I want to help the Ukrainians. I know people in Ukraine. We have a missionary in Ukraine. Okay, get it on it. Got it. But the war, this doesn't make any sense to us. Why are we just going in with both feet? That didn't make any sense. The Afghanistan pullout. What? Why? Immediately you left Bagram Air Force Base? This made no sense. Those are things that occur in the public space for which there's no easy answer. I'm not looking for, you know, facility. I'm looking for, I am looking for the real answer. I want to know why. What and and so what I appreciated about Tucker and continue to appreciate about him is that he does make the confused, 
uh, chaotic things in the world, a bit more understandable, puts them in, in words that uh, make sense to a lot of people. He was very successful at doing it. And now here we have him sort of uh, doing, plying his trade on Twitter. And one of the things we talked to, you and I got to talk on the radio on Friday. And so what was fun was we got to, we got to talk about the news of that day. And that day, we found out that not only was Donald Trump not going to participate in the GOP debate, which is this week as we, we are um, recording, but he was going to be on uh, Tucker's Twitter show. <laughs> And not only and, and not only that, he's he's uh, he's going up against head to head, the Twitter show. Now, I, twenty bucks says his Twitter show is going to beat Fox News in the ratings. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, Fox. Well, it was it was all a setup anyway from Fox, and it was so it was so pathetically veiled. They just wanted all these candidates to go and take pot shots at Trump, and yet the Fox executives went to Bedminster to beg him to come to their stupid little debate, and uh, he didn't he didn't take the bait. You know, they were like, oh, we need the ratings. Please come. And then we're going to use it for ratings. And then we're also going to let everyone take pot shots at you. Because what else would happen on that stage if it wasn't, I don't even know how many candidates they have debating, all going after Donald Trump? Of course, that's what it was going to be. Trump didn't take the bait. And instead, going on Tucker's show was hilarious. The two funny things about the two continued things, <laughs> the two additional things that are funny about this situation is that, number one, whatever <laughs> Trump reveals on Tucker's show, Fox can't talk about because they have a rule that you can't even... <laughs> So whenever what Tucker is that breaks news, okay, because oh, that's who man. they are, because they, they've unpersoned him. So it's like when you leave Fox, you no longer exist. Like you never were there. You don't Voldemort. exist. They can't acknowledge. Yeah, Voldemort. You can't acknowledge anything he's done. <laughs> the second funny thing is that the, 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 the so I've heard that um, uh, Fox is is keep, keeping like a tight control over the um, debate, and they're giving like really limited access to clips to try to get everyone to watch it live, right? Well, what happens the very next day? Trump's getting arraigned in Georgia. So no one, yes. everyone's going to be talking about that. And then there's not going to be any clips to go around. Uh, he, he did that on purpose, right? I mean, that was I pretty well planned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, he has to turn himself in by Friday, right? So yeah, so and, he's uh, do it that yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. Just unbelievable. He just really knows how to play it. And I, I don't understand. Uh, I understand. Uh, wh what I do understand is that there's a wave of anti-Trump sentiment on the Republican side. I mean, Paul Ryan speaks for that entire class of people that is a never Trump. Uh, and he sits on, he's the board president, isn't he? A Fox News board president now. So I think that he's having his way um, and making more of an impact, I, I guess, in that role than he ever was as the uh, Speaker of the House, which he was for a cup of coffee and got his tax program and then moved out because he's got kids to send to private school, I guess. So so there you are. Uh, but I, I do wonder if they really are missing the boat, if they are missing that tranche of people for whom Donald Trump espouses their views, gives them voice. And especially in view of that recent song, what is it, Rich Men North of Richmond? I mean, you're starting to see things like this. And and the cavalier folks over, you know, making the decisions over at Fox News just don't seem to, I don't think they get it. No, they don't get it. And, uh, at, you know, Paul Ryan pu publicly said just a few weeks ago on CNBC or somewhere, that he would vote for anyone for president if he was not named Trump. So, like, Biden, Kamala, I mean, like, you know, Newsom. Oh, he said anyone except anyone not named Trump, you would vote for president. Okay, so there you go. Uh, honey Boo Boo, anyone, there you go. Uh, I can't believe that. Honey Boo Boo is not even, like, a, co a relevant cultural reference anymore. I don't even know why that popped in my head. But, um, you know, but uh, but one thing, um, I think with Tucker and why he connect, why he's been such an important, I guess, vessel is that he comes from that Paul Ryan world. He comes from that private school world. He comes from the nice Northwest Washington neighborhood. He's known all these people his whole life. And he knows exactly who they are and how they work and what they're about. And, you know, kind of like Trump, who came from that donor class world. And he, and he used to always talk about how he knows how he knows how to, he knows how good he has it. He knows how to work the machine. He knows how to get politicians to do things. Um and, but Tucker comes from it more from a cultural side and he asks all the questions that we all want to know that no one else will ask. You know, when he was um, giving, when he did the interview with Devin Archer, if you recall, and and uh, about the Hunter Biden, and you know, what was most powerful about that was it just 
he just the two of them just so plainly laid out exactly how Washington works and how corrupt it is. And yeah. and only Tucker could do that because he knew the exact questions to ask because he's been he's seen it for 20, 30 years. You know, he knows exactly he's what's disarming. going on. Very disarming. He, and and none of the Washington media would think to ask those questions because it's so normal to them. They don't think and that's here's newsworthy. Devin Archer. And yeah. then Devin Archer then really pretty much lays out the 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 game, and that's right. you know our our product was was Joe Biden, and and we brought Joe Biden to the table, and uh, we were hoping to make a financial vehicle out of whatever it was we were doing, and it turns out that Joe was really the guy that that was that was our product. So yeah, and um, if it weren't for a crackhead leaving a laptop in New Jersey, we would never know that, and that's just one politician, you know. I mean, right? It, like right. that's that's it. You know, this reminds me of an observation I was thinking about as I was reading your book, Tucker and Tucker right here. I want to make sure everybody sees it. Here we go. Um, and that is, it, he, he knows a lot of really interesting people, obviously. You don't spend as many years in, in his business as he has and not have interesting friends and that sort of thing. But, you know, there are people I know in the journalism business who have uh, undertaken a, 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 it's their, it's their thing to collect people, collect people. Like here's my friend from over here. Or here's, you know, and, and have them in a one place at Christmas for a party and then see my, see my kooky conservative friend over here and whatever it is. I, I get the impression from your writing that more than that, Tucker Carlson actually in had these people were his real friends and he didn't collect them so much as he relied on them. And engaged in friendship with them and yeah. one of his neighbors you talk about in the book yeah yeah who, see um it's it's um he his i mean his family's most important thing in the world his wife Susie, you know and he you know talks so much about you know he's he's a great um he's a great marriage counselor a lot of people who know him told have told me and uh, he, you know, believes in, you know, the power of those relationships and trust. And, you know, he made some comment like, you know, I cannot believe living in some some life where you don't trust your wife or you don't trust this person or this person. He has to keep his, his circle really tight. Uh, and I also just got the, I, I think he, you know, I'm sure he likes his famous, interesting friends. He certainly loves having dinner with Donald Trump. We write about that in the book and stuff like that. But I get the impression he also just loves being around everyday people and loves hearing what they have to think. And, and he, you know, has a lot of people like that in his life, just total random people. And I write about some in the book who had a happenstance encounter with him and they've been friends for years and, and, and hang out and go fishing together. And, um, I saw that side of him. I saw him around just average Joe's and, and, um, and he seemed very happy in that element, you know? Uh, and, uh, that, that seems to be a really important part of his life too. I know that he was friends with Hunter Biden and that, that was just, I know I've heard him allude to that, but you were actually put uh, muscle and bone on, on that relationship a little bit, but I was surprised at the people. He had that whole family up to his main house for, I don't know, a few days or what have you, and got to know them really well. Their, their wives were uh, very, very good friends and just saw the, uh, this relationship between these two just disintegrate. And he was very saddened by that but there's more to the relationship than that as you write about but it's just people like that you just like that's a person who's definitely of the donor class as you put it but then there's there are other people let's let's um go to and call it an audible on kenny and and here is a speech that he gave at a well a well-known person for many people but not certainly not universally known man who died and tucker came from all the way from Maine, which it's not, I mean, you got to take a couple of ferries and a boat and, you know, you just hope that the tides are right or whatever it is. I mean, it's not easy. He gets there. It's in, I think it was Modesto, California. Stockton. Oh, Stockton. Stockton. I think Modesto. so. I think okay. Stockton. Yeah. Okay. It's around there. So yeah, yeah, there around there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was very dusty, I'm sure. And here he is talking about this person who inspired him. And let's take a listen. And the letter, if I can just summarize it for memory, was always stand tall, stay loyal, ah, which made me emotional reading it, stay loyal, remain free, and always value honor. 
Stand tall, stay loyal, remain free, and always value honor. And I thought to myself, if there is a phrase that sums up more perfectly what I want to be, what I aspire to be, and the kind of man I respect, I can't think of a phrase that sums it up more perfectly than that. Okay. So the cheers. And I didn't say who it was, and I didn't say what it was for. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's in your book. I know you yeah. probably want to save it as a surprise a little bit, but I just found it no, that's so okay. that was interesting. At, yeah, that was at the, the funeral for Sonny Barger, who was the head of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. And uh, <laughs> he, sh- he went from, from rural Maine, very, very rural Maine, to um, Modesto or Stockton, whichever one it was, uh, to be there for that funeral and give that short little speech. Uh, and, um, uh, and then we write about in the book, you know, you know, why Sonny Barger, he, he, he didn't know Sonny Barger. They weren't, he didn't know him personally, but, um, uh, there was, a, a sort of a, a literary connection there, but he wanted to, he, he found that letter that Sonny wrote before he died and said, I'm going to be there at this guy's funeral. Uh, and then of course it was so funny to watch like liberal California bloggers after that, you know, they're so confused about why. Tucker Carlson in his loafers and gingham shirt around a bunch of bikers and their leather vests and uh, earsings. Um, but, uh, you know, the crowd absolutely loved him there. You know, they were like, they were so thrilled to see him too. Uh, but that that's a good, you know, that that's a, a perfect example of, of um, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that he did that and that 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 that, um, that, that passage really moved him and inspired him. And before, when you, when you were mentioning Hunter Biden, um, you know, a lot of his, what he said to me about Hunter had to deal with, again, talking about good and evil is about hunter's addiction and and the way in which you know tucker's sober but he's one of those sober people who's very happy to be sober every day as he described hunter hunter's one of those people that's one cocktail away from a bender and the way that he you know spoke about that grip that addiction has on people he spoke of it as a demonic force you know and it is it's chaos and destruction it's just it's something in you that just destroys things and he talked a lot about hunter biden hunter he knows and and you know what he thinks that that uh, that grip has done to him and, and how he sees that in other people. Hmm. Yeah. And he, he's a really, uh, very, very clever person. He can put into words the observations he makes and, um, you know, it's kind of, sometimes it's just, it's devastating, you know, it's just devastating. It was, and by the way, I mean, it's very, uh, matter of fact about what he said about Hunter in the book. And you know, there had to have been more there. I mean, it must have killed him and his wife that their friends were going through this. Did he ever talk about that a little bit more? Uh, You know, he, yeah, he he just sort of, you know, he said that, that, you know, the love between Hunter and, and um, uh, President Biden is very real. You know, he thinks that, that Joe really loves his son. Um, I had someone else mention to me when I when I when they read the book, they said, you know, is that really love though to pimp your son out like that and make all the other way you did with the business? But I said, I don't know. I didn't I didn't actually even really kind of um, think more deeply about that at the time. But I was just, you know, he said that he really admires the Bidens for being very clannish, but because uh, he likes clannishness. So yeah, I got him saying, you know, but then also, you know, he he <laughs> he didn't have any, anything nice to say about Doctor Jill. Uh, but, um, but he's known the Bidens forever. They live down the street from them in DC and he knows sort of what they're up to and what kind of a family they are. And also how, you know, uh, you know, how Joe will just sort of do anything. He's just, you know, anyone's man for a dollar, that sort of a thing. And so it is that he decided to basically, I guess, abandon their house. Did they sell it and everything? And this happened after a very tumultuous time and uh, in which um, the family was just terrorized. Can you talk a little bit about that? Antipa attacked his home in, in um, uh, uh, right up in the midterm elections in 2018. And that was the reason why he left D.C. Uh, and, you know, the New York Times was threatening to dox him to where he lives in Maine. Uh, you know, the liberal media was laughing about it and they absolutely loved it. But uh, his wife, Susie, was home and she was, you know, hiding in the pantry as Antipa was banging down the door and trying to break it down. Um, and, uh, you know, that was the the final straw for them. That, that's when he, Tucker said, we're out of here. And they packed up and totally left. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing. And th- this was occurring during a, um, I mean, if you recall, I mean, there was all sorts of death. There was all sorts of violence happening from the left at the time. Death threats. There were all sorts of members of the Trump administration who were being 
you know, docks their, their whereabouts in real time. Mobs would show up at restaurants and harass them. And it was happening amongst all of that. And uh, uh, and that was perfectly OK at the time. Because, of course, of course it was. the Democrats yeah, of course were it doing Because these people are, are evil. They deserve it, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> of course. They're 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 literal fascists. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, Ch- Chadwick Moore, thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. And I hope we can visit again in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Victoria. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So it was great spending some time with Chadwick. I've been able to visit with him three times now, two on the podcast and once on the radio, and he's as genuine as they come. And what I love about the fact that he could do this book, Tucker, is that he was given carte blanche to do it. Tucker Carlson uh, participated, and uh, Chadwick stayed at their house. Now, you might think, oh, golly, you know, that's a little too close to the subject. I don't know. He doesn't seem to think so. I think it also gives him an insight into how his family works and how when he participates in a recording or what have you at the main uh, studio, he's got a studio in Maine, Tucker Carlson does, and a studio in Florida, the people, his guests, they he flies them in. And then they have after the the show, his uh, he's got a, a couple. He's got one person. The gal does the makeup, and then the guy is the cook. And there's uh, another security guard out there that they have. Uh, so it's pretty streamlined, and everybody's armed, by the way. And, uh, and <laughs> Antifa, and uh, he just sort of enjoys life with him. And that's the one thing I really appreciated about getting to know the subject of this book is his gusto for life. And one of the things that comes through real clear in his uh, first foray post Fox on Twitter was the essence of that. So we're going to roll a little cut for you right now in case you haven't seen it or don't remember it. It's been a bit. And uh, let's listen to the first, some of the first words he said after he left Fox. Both political parties and their donors have reached consensus on what benefits them, and they actively collude to shut down any conversation about it. Suddenly, the United States looks very much like a one-party state. That's a depressing realization, but it's not permanent. Our current orthodoxies won't last. They're brain dead. Nobody actually believes them. Hardly anyone's life is improved by them. This moment is too inherently ridiculous to continue, and so it won't. The people in charge know this. That's why they're hysterical and aggressive. They're afraid. They've given up persuasion. They're resorting to force. But it won't work. When honest people say what's true, calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. At the same time, the liars who've been trying to silence them shrink and they become weaker. That's the iron law of the universe. True things prevail. Where can you still find Americans saying true things? There aren't many places left, but there are some, and that's enough. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. So you get the idea that things are not um, falling apart in the world of Tucker Carlson and his family. One of the most surprising things that we discussed in our last visit with Chadwick was the fact that his wife has never seen any of his shows. She didn't watch at CNN. She didn't watch him on MSNBC. She didn't watch him on Fox, but she read his monologues every single day. And I think that's probably a healthy thing. Plus, they don't have the TV on in their house, didn't have their TV on for their kids or anything, and tried to keep them away from the political fray as much as they could. And uh, But of course, you know, Tucker grew up in the political fray. His dad was a TV news guy. He also worked for the Reagan administration, uh, for Voice of America and other Uh, news outlets. Sometimes people thought he might be a spook and that sort of thing. Who knows? He did not cop to it. And uh, what I wanted to ask Chadwick about and that I didn't get an opportunity to was if he got to read the um, autobiography written by Tucker's dad and uh, that he refers to a lot, but it was never published. So it's just in its manuscript form or what have you, and maybe just, I don't know, published for the kids. Who knows? But his life Dick Carlson's life was utterly, just utterly surprising. And his philosophy of life, utterly surprising. He came from a broken home himself and he was, you know, he was adopted and all sorts of things went on in his family. And they were in a, in effect replicated in, in Tucker's family, his, his, you know, kids. And, uh, but what was really 
fascinating was, you know, how does a guy come from a well, well-heeled household and then ends up, this is Dick Carlson, and then ends up allowing his kids to hitchhike, hunt, and push the limits in their private lives? That is a free-range dad. I mean, that is a pretty amazing thing. And so he does his mom, you know, basically abandoned the family. She was a, an heiress. And then Dick Carlson married another heiress. And uh, what was interesting was that the his mom, who was dying, and uh, I think it was 06 or something, and and somebody, she he gets word that she's dying in France. And he talks to his brother, and they don't go to the funeral. They don't go and see her before she dies. Is that a, is that a bad thing, or is it a self-preservation thing? It sounds to me as if it was a self-preservation thing, but also mixed with the fact that she never cared about us. Why would she care to see us now? So fascinating story around that with regard to the will and, oh, all sorts of internecine intrigue. So I advise you and heartily recommend the, the Tucker book. And uh, Chadwick Moore does an excellent job. It's a it's an it's a wonderful read. It will go fast. And uh, there's a lot of meat in there if you want to find the meat. Uh, you'll find them if you want to see what how complex this individual was and why it is that he says the things he says on the air. And I, you know, I've known of Tucker Gal since he wrote wrote for the Weekly Standard years and years and years ago for Bill Crystal, who now can't stand him. And I've always thought he was a bit iconoclastic, and now I know that he's sort of come full circle, refound faith. And allowed that to inform his uh, political opinions in, in many respects, where you just look at things, and, and I've come to this, you know, arrived at this conclusion too. You just really can't pay too much attention to what the shiny object is over there. You really do have to get to fundamental first principles, and you have to decide, okay, now looking at this situation, is this is this um, something that's good, or is this something that's not good? And then concentrate on the good, and you'll never be let down at all. And so I've tried to implement my own that in my own life, and Tucker Carlson's been very successful at it in his. Okay, until next time, see ya, and thanks for enjoying the Adults in the Room podcast. Appreciate you coming on and being with us today. And don't forget, join up, subscribe, share. Uh, let's see, what else do I have to say? Uh, on Rumble, YouTube, Odyssey. Uh, you've got it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and every other podcast format, Anchor FM, that, that all of them were all available there until they decide that they're, they don't want us anymore and decide to censor us. So there you go. This may, hey man, this might get us censored. Who knows? You just never know. So stick with us and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Adult in the Room podcast. To keep the programs you like to listen to, please rate this podcast with a fantastic five stars on your Apple podcast app every time you listen and give me a great review. Plus, of course, subscribe to the podcast. It makes a difference with the big tech algorithm and the big tech oligarchs, and it makes us easier to find. Please get in touch with me on all the big tech stuff. Yeah, we're still there. Using the names Victoria Taft or the Adult in the Room podcast on MeWe, Parlor, Minds, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks to 1A Cast for imaging, editing, and production. The fantastic song is Gospel by the March 4th Band of Portland, Oregon. Music for Antifa versus Mike Strickland is Ride or Die by Raps by RC. The Adult in the Room podcast is also a production of Flamingo Road Studios. Remember, head up, heart out, and strive to be the adult in the room. Till next time, mischief managed. <laughs>